The first part of these four is on evolution and ethology. Now these are quite biological topics, but as we go through you'll see there's more and more relevance to modern day psychology as we go. So last week we looked at the birth of psychology from its philosophical origins. Now today we're going to do the same thing, but from the biological side. So we'll look at the, the history of psychology from sort of a biological origin. And along the way, the key schools and concepts are going to be evolutionary theory, ethology, evolutionary psychology, eugenics, social Darwinism, intelligence testing, and just for good measure, right at the end, not quite related, but we've got to chuck it in somewhere, Freudian psychodynamics. So this first part then is on evolution and ethology. And the objectives here are just to give you a, an overview of evolutionary theory and how it might contribute to psychology. So we look at evolutionary theories of Darwin and Lamarck and Darwin. Look at natural and artificial selection, maybe sexual selection, and see how they they may be important to psychology. Looking at the the more direct application of evolutionary theory to psychology in places like behaviour, language and emotions and see how some psychologists have been influenced by evolutionary theory. So let's start with evolution. This is a picture of Darwin, but not the Darwin that you may be thinking of. This is Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. And he had his own theories on evolution, maybe not as developed as Charles, but he certainly had his own theories. So the point of this slide is to show you that the concept of evolution was not invented by Charles Darwin. Um, like all ideas, evolutionary theory has been around for a long time. Um, you can find evolutionary theories in Greek writing, in the ancient Greeks, and Anaximander, for example. And Erasmus Darwin, who coincidentally was born in Nottinghamshire, also had uh, thoughts on evolution. And during his life, Erasmus formed a botanical society. He wrote about plants and animals. He was strongly influenced by the British Associationist School of Philosophy, and he also wrote on evolution. And I've extracted this quote from him, and he says, In the great length of time since the earth began, millions of ages before mankind, all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, endued with animality, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions and associations, continuing to improve by its own inherent activity, and of delivering down those improvements by generation. And I think we would still say something pretty similar today. So evolution has happened over millions of years. All animals are related somehow to the same original entity. And animals have behaviours and psychologies, irritations, sensations, volitions and associations that we might recognise today. And in fact, it sounds quite similar to the early psychological schools of Wundt and James. But this was 60 years before Darwin published his own book. Charles Darwin, that is. And between Erasmus Darwin and Charles Darwin, there was a chap called Lamarck who sort of fleshed, fleshed out the perhaps the fully most fully developed theory of evolution before Darwin. And Lamarck's ideas were that animals would change over time through two forces. One force was a complexifying force, which made animals sort of strive towards ever greater and better organisation. And another force was an, adapta an adaptation force, a force that allowed animals to adapt to their circumstances. Now, Lamarck had quite a big theory, but he's often only cited for his for his ideas on the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And that's the idea that what you do during your lifetime changes your body and your your genetics, and that and those changes then pass down to your children. So, for example, if a giraffe kept trying to stretch up and eat the eat the leaves on the taller trees, then the children of that giraffe, the giraffe babies, would also have longer necks. And this idea has sort of been ridiculed over history, but modern epigenetics has actually found there's some evidence that some things do um, do transmit through the generations which are acquired during your life. So the idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics, um, there may be some truth in it. 
So that's Lamarck's ideas on evolution. And this is, again, several decades before Charles Darwin. But Charles Darwin was the winner in the evolutionary race to get the right answer. Um, so that's who we remember. We think of evolution and we think of Charles Darwin. So let's spend a few slides looking at Charles's work. So he originally studied to be a doctor and then I think his father made forced him to be a, a priest at Cambridge. Um, but along the way, Charles was always in, uh, interested in animals and nature and he became particularly distracted by beetles and collected thousands of them from Britain and elsewhere. He went on a holiday studying Welsh rocks in summer of 19, uh, 1831. And when he got back, he realised he was invited to join the famous trip on HMS Beagle as its ship's naturalist. And over the next five years, he spent touring the world, looking at rocks, insects, plankton, fossils, finches, and, and hundreds and thousands of other kinds of animals and birds and insects and plants. He made an awful lot of notes, and he took a lot of specimens home. And then he sort of waited um, for 20 or 30 years. He was quite sick, so he spent a lot of time at home in Kent, um, being looked after by his his um, cousin and wife, uh, <laughs> Emma Wedgwood, I think, or one of the other Wedgwoods. And during that long time, he studied worms, doves, sweet peas, barnacles, lots and lots of different things. And he was trying to formulate his ideas on evolution and how he might sort of tie it all together. And one book which said to be quite influential on his theory of evolution by natural selection was Malthus's essay on the principle of population. And in reading that, Darwin realised that there are more animals that are born all the time than can survive, and populations keep growing until they run out of resources. And when that's the case, there's, there's a struggle between individuals of the same species and of other species for these same resources, these limited resources. So over these intervening decades between coming back from the Beagle in 1836 and writing his famous book in 1859, Darwin was collecting his evidence very carefully and slowly and thinking about how to frame his ideas. And in 1856, um, he was told that Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, had also had the same idea about evolution, that it was a sort of a natural selection of of characters. And, and so in 1858, they wrote a paper together, calling themselves two indefatigable naturalists. They wrote a paper about the natural means of selection. This is a relatively short paper when you compare it to his book. And Darwin's book was published a year later, 1859, and that was... Uh, you know, a masterpiece, a massive collection of facts, beautifully written. And if you if you only ever read one book to do with this course, I would I'd guess that Darwin's Origin of Species would be would be a good one. So in 1859, then after 25, nearly 30 years of research, collecting and categorizing and studying the tiniest things from beetles all the way up to giant tortoises, Darwin published his theory. His theory of evolution by natural selection is really quite simple. The first thing is that he noted organisms differ. So animals of the same species, they differ from each other. And this could be due to their inheritance. Maybe their parents are slightly different, but also from random mutations and random chances. The second important thing is that the environment and resources change as well. So there could be an earthquake or a volcano or a hurricane and the environment might, environment might change fundamentally. Or there could be many other animals of your own species or animals of different species that are competing with you in the same environment and resources. So the third thing he noticed was that there are more organisms that are born than are able to survive. So there aren't enough resources to support all of these animals all the time. And this is an idea that comes from Malthus on population. And then the, the fourth one is the key thing, is that of all the organisms that are around, and all the random differences among those organisms, the ones which are, happen to be best adapted to the current conditions will survive. They'll, they'll survive and they'll thrive, and they, they're the ones that will live long enough to have um, successful offspring. And those offspring will also survive and thrive. So there's no real deliberate process here. There's the fact that organisms are different from each other. Um, there's the fact that the environment is 
changing and in both time and space, that there's too many organisms to survive in any one time and place, and so those which are the best adapted to the current conditions will tend to reproduce. I'd like to add at this stage that people often talk about the theory of evolution, um, and I think that's, that's wrong. I think evolution is, is the fact which different theories are trying to explain. So the fact of evolution is that things aren't the same now as they used to be. As long as you believe the fossil record, you know, that dinosaurs once existed and so on, that we know that lots of dinosaurs are no longer here. So we know that things have changed. So evolution is the fact. Things have changed. And the key thing is how do you explain the fact that they've changed? How can you explain that? And that's where Darwin's theory comes in. So the theory is actually the theory of natural selection. It's not the theory of evolution. It's the theory of evolution by natural selection. And I think that's a really important point that is often missed in, for example, popular popular science or popular media or you know, conspiracy theories. So there are more animals around than can survive. Uh, some of them are more adapted and some of them are less adapted to their current environment. So how does that result in completely different species? So, you know, we are not, we are very different from chimpanzees, but at some point we must have come from the same animal. So how is it that, that species come to separate from each other? And the idea is that very small changes will happen maybe over hundreds of years or thousands or even hundreds and thousands or millions of years. And as these small changes add up, you tend to get animals diverging from each other. So, for example, our common ancestor with chimps might have been six million years ago. Um, and maybe we were all hanging out on a on a hillside um, and there was a storm and our group got separated and one one side of the group went down one side of the mountain and one side went down the other side. And then they were completely separated and they started living in slightly different locations, different weather patterns, different sources of food, different uh, competition from different species. And over a long, long time, these relatively small differences at the start can become greater and greater. And so two groups of animals can evolve from the same original group. And at some point, those two groups are no longer able to interbreed to produce a fertile offspring. So you're thinking of uh, horses and donkeys. They can breed and have, uh, they can have, is it mules or asses, depending on which way you mix them up. But those offspring are not fertile. So the horses and donkeys are pretty close to each other, but they can't have fertile offspring. So at some point along this line of changes, the two, the two different sets of animals can no longer breed together. And that's when a new species has arisen. And that is the origin of species. So let's take an example quite close to home. Um, here are the squirrels of University Park, Nottingham. So let's just say that some squirrels are naturally slow and some squirrels are naturally fast. And they're not deliberately fast or slow not striving to be fast, as, as Lamarck might have said. They're just fast squirrels, these red ones. And fast squirrels get to the food, you know, when you chuck some crumbs of bread down to your squirrels, the fast ones will get there first. They'll also be able to escape all the bicycles and other things that trundle around the park. And, you know, if there's a race to find a partner, they the fast ones might find a sexual partner first. So over time, the number of fast squirrels will generally increase and the number of slow squirrels will tend to decrease. But there's nothing purposeful or deliberate about it. It's just random variation that happens to make them more adapted to the current situation that they find themselves in. So there's another important point I think is often missed by people talking about evolution. All life on Earth has been evolving for the same amount of time, let's say four billion years. So you can say that it's all equally evolved. You know, the worm is just as evolved as the chimpanzee. So you, you shouldn't say we are more or less evolved than chimpanzees or any other animal. But in fact, we evolved differently. We evolved with different selection pressures in different environments, different heritages, different effects and causes along the way. So the, the way to talk about this is that we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. And that one happened to be about six million years ago. And the same can be said of all species. So plants and bacteria and humans and slugs, we're all related and we can all find at some stage a common ancestor. So that's enough biology, I think. So how does this fit in with our 
story that we're telling of how psychology came into being. Well, before evolution, the church and religious ideas were really dominant in many societies, and in particular in, in the Christian world. And Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was a challenge to some of these great religions and philosophies. So here's a good example that Christianity had a notion of the great chain of being, or scala nature in, in Latin. And in this great chain of being, which is illustrated in this picture, God was at the top. There he is in a big chair. Um, there was the, the sort of band of angels in the clouds around him there and in the top top row. On the third row down, in the third row of the great chain of being, were humans. And there we all are, sinful and uh, wandering around the earth. And below humans, there were animals. Below animals, there were plants. And at the very bottom of it all were rocks and minerals. So in, in Christianity's view of the place of, na- the place of man in nature, humans in nature, we were third place, and then the animals, plants and rocks were below us. But in Charles Darwin's view of evolution and in the biological view of evolution, humans, animals and plants are all equally evolved and equally complex and equally long living on the earth. And so that really changes the position of, of man in, in these religious hierarchies. And that's why it was so challenging. So you may be thinking you've come to the wrong lecture. Um, <clears throat> you, you, this isn't this isn't the psychology degree that you signed up for. Um, but stick with it. And I promise that all this stuff about evolution and animals is, is going to be relevant for understanding how psychology came into being. And I hope to try and convince you of that over the rest of, of the lecture. So just take a little break and sort of breathe all that in and then have a little shuffle around and think again about the rest of this bit. So to summarise what we've done so far, we've noticed that evolutionary theory was always around in philosophy and science, but Darwin's detailed work over 20 or 30 years was enough to convince the scientific world completely that this must be the right answer. And if you have any doubt about that, I just suggest reading that book. Um, it's, It's a tour de force. So Darwin's thoughts were a challenge to the uh, religious world. But empiricist philosophy, so the British empiricist school, for example, had already done quite a lot to separate religious belief and scientific thought. Remember um, Hume, who disregarded all the possibility that there could be a God and, uh, and other notions that we separated the religious and scientific philosophical notions. So Darwin's book then sort of allowed, gave permission for a whole new set of sciences of human and animal behavior to flourish. And they didn't need to try and please the church anymore. And they didn't need to try and please the philosophers anymore because they had a new founding principle of evolution to to organize their work. And one of the important um, consequences of evolutionary theory on was on animal behavior. And that's the, the topic of ethology, which I'm going to talk about next. And then in following videos, you're going to you're going to read and hear about um, other ways in which evolutionary theory has influenced psychology and society. And I've added at the bottom this quote from Dobzhansky, who's a Russian uh, biologist, and he made a very often repeated quote, which is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I think this is quite a powerful thing to say. I mean, it's saying that this is our new ground truth. You know, this is the organizing principle for all of biology. And I think to some extent you could say psychology too, because we are, you know, if you follow the theory of evolution, then we are evolved in the same way that all biology is evolved. So have that in the back of your mind, that the theory of evolution really was a turning point, a rejection of certain philosophies and religious beliefs, and a, and a whole new basis for understanding biology. And one of the direct descendants from evolutionary theory was ethology and that's essentially the evolution of behavior so how have animals behavior come to be adapted and changed by environmental considerations and darwin himself started talking about humans and emotions and behavior in his book expression of emotion in man and animals and this was very influential for the ethologists So the subject of ethology deals with the psychologically very important topics of instinct, habit, aggression, learning, habituation, mating and sexual selection, 
and social groups. And we're going to have a look at three of the main ethologists in the early, early days and look at what they did and how they approached their topics. So the first of our ethologists is uh, Tinbergen, and he was most famous for studying herring gulls. That's the uh, seagulls you might get at the beach trying to steal your chips. So they're very, uh, they're very adaptive and resourceful birds um, and also quite hungry, I, I imagine. So here is Nico Tinbergen um, with a massive cardboard cutout of a seagull there. Um, and in that box, he's got some, some chicks, some, some baby seagull chicks. And there's a seagull chick on the right, quite cute. Um, now, what Nico Timbergen's doing there is uh, showing the baby gulls a picture of a seagull, uh, an adult seagull. And the red spot on the, the bird's beak is really important. That red spot serves as a cue, a stimulus, to make the bird peck at the parent's mouth and try and get some food. And essentially, Timbergen just thought, well, what if I try and recreate this with cardboard? Uh, what, if, <laughs> what if I make the red spot bigger? What if I uh, make the whole bird bigger? And he found that the chicks would continue to peck for even quite abstract uh, representations of, of the bird. So larger bird's head, impossibly large bird's head, they would peck, peck even stronger. And the important thing here is that actually you could take the stimulus far away from the real stimulus, you know, this massive cardboard cutout of a bird's head, and the chick would peck even stronger. And weirdly, the strongest thing that the the chick would peck at is illustrated in the picture on the right and that's a red stick just a simple like a pencil um, a red pencil with three white bands and three and you know red bands in between it so a, a red and white stripy pole like a barber's pole was this you know a, the best stimulus in this case and you can see the picture of the chick there he's preferring to peck at the the red barber's pole than the fake cut out seagull head and this is what Tim Bergen called the super normal stimulus. So it's a stimulus which is completely unnatural, but it actually elicits an even stronger response in the chick. And so the chick has certain instincts that it wants to peck at a red thing on a, on a bird, on a stick. But actually, if you make it, make it white and red and you make it stick like, it pecks even stronger. It's a super normal stimulus. And Tim Bergen also did things with um, stickleback fish and honeybees. We'll move on to a second ethologist. Conrad Lorentz is famous for his geese. And I'm just going to try and show you this video. So he realised that if, if he was the first thing that baby geese saw after they hatched, or one of the things they saw moving around in, in the early part of their development, then the chicks would follow him everywhere they went. Uh, <laughs> And I guess once they started following him, he, had, he then had to train them how to swim and, and later how to fly. Um, and this, this idea that the birds would follow him no matter what was called imprinting. And it's an extremely strong form of learning. If you're interested in this idea, then um, there's some more videos of, of Conrad Lorentz getting the geese to fly and following him downhill. And he even gets a hang glider so that he can fly with the geese. It's really very pretty. So Lorenz's biggest contribution was probably imprinting and you know the mechanisms of attachment between uh, young infants and their parents. And he also wrote about aggression and human aggression and how it might be controlled and elicited. Now I just want to mention because um, because he's a he's a controversial character and he might come across some things about Lorenz. Um, he was a member of the Nazi Party uh, before the Second World War, um, and he. You know, his, his university research was supported by and he supported ideas about um, racial hygiene and, and other things that were really um, very difficult and controversial and uh, pretty appalling concepts through the Second World War. I, and this is going to come up a bit more in the second half of these lectures when we talk again about um, how evolutionary theory connects with, with some uh, disturbing trends in history. So I just wanted to mention that there so that you are aware of it if you come across it on your reading. Our third ethologist is von Frisch, also an Austrian like Lorenz, and he's famous for bees, and you've probably heard of this aspect of, of von Frisch's work. So he studied, first of all, he studied bees' sensory perceptions, so smell, taste, vision, and discovered they were really quite remarkably sensitive to these things, to sugary things and coloured things. 
He also found out that bees communicate to other bees about the sources of food using this waggle dance, it's called. And the bees would sort of walk in a bit of a circle. And then on one side of the circle, they would do this zigzaggy left-right waggle. And this waggle would indicate the direction of food to the other bees. So if you find some food, you come back to the hive, you do a little dance, and then the bees know where to go to find the same food. And by studying these very carefully, he was able to work out there was a lot of information being communicated by one bee to the other bees in the hive. Von Frisch also worked on pheromones and how they influence bees' behaviour, social interaction, like the communication above, and sexual attraction, how pheromones can affect workers and, and queen bees. So that's the end of the biology. Um, although these two topics, evolution and mythology, are probably not often taught as core parts of psychology, um, I think they've been really extremely influential in the 20th century psychology that we, that we now know and love. So if you think about behaviorism and behavioral psychology and reward and punishment, um, there's an awful lot in common there with ethology. You know, it's really trying to break down the, the components of stimuli which, which elicit particular responses, trying to um, increase and decrease those responses and trying to find the, you know, the ideal stimulus for particular responses. That's very, a lot of behaviorism does exactly that sort of stuff. And then, of course, there's evolutionary psychology, which is a whole discipline in itself, and that tries to understand human behavior by applying evolutionary theory. And then there's comparative psychology, again, another complete discipline in psychology, and that's doing psychology in non-human animals, for example, parrots, um, crows, chimpanzees, monkeys, chickens. There's an awful lot of psychology which has been done with animals. And so the influence of evolutionary and ethological thought has really been quite strong in psychology. So thank you to uh, all the gentlemen who have contributed to this work. Write down some questions. If you have any comments or questions, write them down and bring them to the Q&A.